reading will be Acts 18, verses 9 through 11. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking, and don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. Good morning, everyone. It is certainly good to see everybody. Please get a Bible out, turn it to Acts 18, where Brandon just read from. Acts chapter 18, we're going to continue our Acts series. I recognize whenever I started this series at the beginning of the year, I said I was going to be doing it on the third Sundays, and uh, that plan went out the door. So at some point in each uh, month, we're talking about the book of Acts. So today is the fourth Sunday, of course, but we are still working our way through the book of Acts. And I recognize we've had people place membership with us. We've had people be baptized. We've had recent visitors come since uh, we started this in the beginning of the new year. So I just want to remind everybody why we're talking about the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts records for us more than just the early church history, but it also records for us the stories and the conversion experiences that various saints encountered in the first century. But it also tells us how the gospel message was able to get to a lot of the known world in only a 30-year span. And if you've ever wondered how much time and how we know how much time spanned from Acts 1 all the way to chapter 28, uh, there's actually something that's going to be particularly helpful in the section we look at today. And we'll talk about why we know that this particular chapter was about 20 years after the day of Pentecost. We'll look at that more in just a second. But as we've been watching the brethren in the book of Acts, we've been learning some lessons for ourselves as current kingdom workers. And in recent months, we have been taking a look at the Apostle Paul and looking at uh, his different preaching trips in the different places that he has been going. Last month, in chapter 17, we left Paul in Athens, and that is in the same area it is today. It is in Greece, over here where it says Achaia, Paul was in Athens. And in chapter 18, in verse 1, it says, after this, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And as much time as we're going to be spending looking at Paul today, in the story we're looking at, it's not just the Apostle Paul that the book of Acts follows. There are many other brethren that the book of Acts decides to zero in on for us to learn some lessons. Other characters who take center stage in this story of God's message being proclaimed around the known world. And we're going to be looking at many of those people today. So don't think of just the Apostle Paul, but think about the others that are mentioned in these chapters as well. Why don't we go ahead and begin in Acts 18 and verse 1. It says, After this, he, that is Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus who had recently come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews, both Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will only go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. We're introduced to Paul in Corinth, and really, the best way, I think, to break down these eight verses is just by also looking at the different believers that are mentioned in this city. First, of course, we have Paul mentioned in verse 1, and uh, I don't want to overlook that, but in verse 2 and 3, we're also introduced to two new characters by the name of Priscilla and Aquila. Now, Aquila, he comes from a long way away. He comes from a region called Pontus, and that was far north, up, up against the Black Sea. If you were looking at a map, I know I had one up there earlier, but he was up way from the northern area, and he is somebody who had traveled a lot. We're informed that not only is he from Pontus, but he had also recently come from Rome, over there in Italy. And he had been driven out by Claudius. Him and his wife, Priscilla, are very important Bible characters. 
We've talked about them a lot, actually, in recent months. Uh, well, sorry, we're going to be talking about them more tonight in Romans 16. But we also did an entire lesson about a year ago on Priscilla and Aquila. They show up a lot in the scriptures. And what's really particularly interesting about Priscilla and Aquila is not only do they show up a lot in scripture, but every time they show up in scripture, they're somewhere else geographically as well. Uh, it, it already being introduced Priscilla and Aquila, you learned that they had been in Italy, they had been in Rome, but been driven out. And now they are in Corinth, but a little bit later we're going to see them in Ephesus, something Paul brings up again in 1 Corinthians 16, that they are stationed in Ephesus and a church is meeting in their home. And then in Romans 16, Paul mentions that they had gone back to Rome and the church was meeting in their home there as well. Over and over again, Priscilla and Aquila are brought up. But as we're introduced to them, we're told that they were tent makers. They were tent makers. And some have suggested that this would just literally mean leather workers of some sort. But this was a trade that was very conducive to anywhere they went. They were going to be able to do it. They were going to be able to pick up clientele. And we're informed that this is actually something the Apostle Paul was doing as well. He had a versatile skill that was needed anywhere he was going to go. But did you see Paul's main priority as well as the, uh, the uh, priority of Priscilla and Aquila, they were not just there to make tents. They were there to preach the word of God. Down in verse 4, it says, He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. Uh, Paul was a full-time evangelist. It didn't matter how he was getting his money, by the way. When we say he's a full-time evangelist, I don't care how he got his money. Paul, anywhere he went, was using every opportunity he had to spread God's word. And here he was doing it with Priscilla and Aquila. We're also introduced in verse 5 to Silas and Timothy arriving from Macedonia. Now, I recognize we've already been introduced to them. Timothy was the young man that Paul had picked up in Acts the 16th chapter from the Galatian region and goes on into Philippi with him. Silas had also been a traveling companion of his. The book of Acts had last left Silas and Timothy in Macedonia, more particularly in Berea in chapter 17 and verse 14. And these two trusted companions of Paul looks like they were on a specific mission while they were left behind in Macedonia. And the language of the text in verse 5 is very unique. It tells us that once Silas and Timothy arrive, Paul devotes himself to the preaching of the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Well, hang on a second, Paul. Weren't you already doing that back in verse 4? What's different? Well, this is where a good reading of the New Testament helps kind of fill in the gaps. We're informed in Philippians 1 and Philippians 4 and 2 Corinthians 8 that the churches in Macedonia had actually been sending money to Paul so that he could devote himself to the preaching of the word on a more full-time basis. He no longer needs to be a tent maker because now he has the funds to be able to live out teaching and preaching. I believe that's what is going on there. Silas and Timothy came to bring that gift to him, and now they join in the work in Corinth. We're also introduced, after Paul is thrown out and no one wants to hear from him anymore, you hear his frustration in verse 6, your blood is on your own head, I am innocent, from now on I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And he took that quite literally, because he went next door to the synagogue and he found a Gentile. He found Titius Justice, somebody who it says was a worshiper of God. He goes next door. He picks up and he continues teaching and preaching. And then in verse 8, we're introduced to Crispus, who was the leader of the synagogue. He believed in the Lord with his whole household. Crispus is actually mentioned in the letter to the Corinthians as well. This is a big get for Paul, but he kept plugging. He kept going. Now, the end of verse 8 tells us that there were many Corinthians when they heard, they believed, and were baptized. Now, if you've really been following along and remembering these stories as we've been going through the book of Acts, if you're Paul, there's something you're anticipating to happen when things are going really well in a city. What has been the pattern for Paul as he's been going through these cities? Well, a bunch of people will come, they get baptized, the local church starts and begins, and he's excited, and then there becomes some friction between him and the local authorities. And he gets either beaten or chased out of town. And so if you're Paul and you're seeing all of these things going well, what's likely in the back of your head? Well, persecution's coming. And I'm about to get invited out of this town. Until verse 9. 
Pick up reading with me in verse 9. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. And as Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or of a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Gallio. What we have happen as Paul is, I, I think, afraid of how much longer he's going to last in Corinth, is the Lord coming with some encouragement. And this encouragement God gives is threefold. The first thing that he says is, don't be afraid. Fear not, some of your translations say. Brother J. Buck did a lesson for us a few weeks ago. Fear not, for I am with you. And I forgot how many he had counted that God had said that throughout the scriptures, but this is one of those times where God says to Paul, do not be afraid. And let me tell you, Paul had every reason to be afraid when you consider all of his past experiences. He has fear for himself, having been left for dead and stoned in Lystra in chapter 14. Having been beaten without a trial in Philippi in Acts the 16th chapter, chased out of Thessalonica and then Berea and then Athens and now to Corinth, Paul has every reason to be afraid. But let me tell you, I don't think he's just afraid for himself. He's afraid for the brethren. These new disciples who have followed Jesus and hear what looks like some persecution coming. And so the first thing Jesus says to him is don't be afraid, but instead... Keep on speaking. Don't be silent. You know, if, it was, if I was the Apostle Paul, or if you were the Apostle Paul, it might be tempting to think, let's just lay low for a while. We clearly have made the synagogue leaders mad. We converted one of the synagogue leaders himself. Things are getting tumultuous. Maybe we should just lay low for a while, and you guys just quietly talk to your neighbors, but I, let's just let's take our foot off the gas here for a moment. But the Lord says to Paul, you keep on speaking and you do not be silent. And why does Jesus tell him that? Because Jesus said to Paul in verse 10, I have many people in this city. Not just people who have already been converted, that is obvious. But Jesus says, I have more people in this city that you need to reach. And so you don't be silent. You keep on speaking that good news. There are people who need to hear the gospel. And imagine Paul just, oh, I can settle in for a little bit. Now, a year and a half doesn't sound long to us, but I know that had to sound long to the Apostle Paul when it was all said and done. I mean, he had spent three weeks in some places, three months in others. A year and a half, that sounded pretty good to him. And so Paul settles in. Now, I want to make mention here of Gallio in verses 12 through uh, uh, 17 there. Uh, this is not Galileo, by the way. That was a 16th century astronomer. And I have been in a Bible class once where, bless the Bible class teacher's heart, he thought that this was Galileo and was making some points about an astronomer. That is not who this is. This is Gallio, and he was the proconsul of Achaia. That's the region that Corinth and Sincrea was in at that time. And the reason why I want to spend just a, a few minutes here or a couple minutes here talking about him is because this Gallio that's described is what aids us in dating many of Paul's preaching trips as well as his epistles that we read. And that's because of something called the Gallio inscription or the Delphi inscription, depending on uh, who you ask. But this was a letter written by Claudius, the, the same Claudius that was mentioned in chapter 18 and verse 2. Claudius was the emperor, he was the Caesar at the time, and he had written a letter to Gallio telling him, you need to get more rich people to move to your city, to Corinth. And what's really interesting in this letter that he wrote to Gallio, and what's in the box there, in the blue box, is the name Gallio, is 
the Caesar actually mentions that it is his 12th year reigning at the beginning of this inscription. And we know for a fact that this Caesar ruled from 41 to 51, or 54 AD. And so if it is his 12th year reigning, when he sends this to Gallio, then we can date this right at 51, 52 AD. And if you're wondering how we can do that, it's because these proconsuls only had a one year term and then they were done. How amazing is it that we have this artifact? And so right here, this year and a half that Paul is spending in Corinth, we can date it to about 51 to 52 AD. That's really helpful whenever we go to consider the history of God's Bible. For you nerds out there, maybe you enjoyed that. Let's look down at verse 18. I'm going to put a map back up here. Um, this should aid us as we kind of talk through what happens next because uh, the, the, the Johnny Cash song, I've Been Everywhere Man, is about to kick in. So look at verse 18. After staying for some time, Paul said farewell to the brothers and sisters and sailed away to Syria. So we're going to go ahead and stop here for now. Paul is up here in Corinth where it says Achaia, and his intentions are to get all the way down here to Syria, to the Jerusalem area. So that's where Paul wants to sail toward. But uh, look down. Sorry, my Bible turned the page. I walk around too much. It tells us in verse 18, he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, and he shaved his head at Sincrea because of the vow he had taken. So they still haven't left the coast of Greece at this point. But in verse 19, when they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and debated with the Jews. Okay, so Paul is wanting to come down to Syria, but they have actually set sail over here to Ephesus, where he is debating with the Jews in the synagogue. And in verse 20, they ask him to stay for a longer time, and he declined. And he said, farewell, and added, I'll come back to you again if God wills. And Paul set sail from Ephesus and landed in Caesarea. So you see where he makes his journey across the Mediterranean Sea, and Paul gets to Caesarea. He goes up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem was on a mountain. He greeted the church, and he went down to Antioch. Antioch was the starting spot of all of Paul's preaching trips. And after spending some time there, he set out traveling through one place after another in the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So you have it in your head. Paul goes from Corinth, he goes to Ephesus, he comes all the way down here to Jerusalem, he goes up to Antioch, and now he's working his way through the regions of Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, and Tarsus, the Galatian region as it is known. That is what we are talking about. And you can write all those places down because I promise you there are, they are important. Now, a couple things to note in this section we just read. Number one, when Paul arrives in the synagogue or in Ephesus, he goes to the synagogue just like he had done in other places. Just because Paul said, I'm done with you Jews, he doesn't mean I'm done trying to teach them. It is still his custom to arrive in the synagogues that is still his pattern which is good because it still works. They invite him to stay for longer. But what's also important to note here, it's going to come back up in our application section here in just a second, is that Paul in verse 21 said, I'll come back to you again if God wills. You see, Paul, he said that there's a chance he might not make it back. He wants to come back, but there's a chance that it might not happen. We'll come back to that in a second. And then thirdly, it makes you ask the question, why would Paul leave a flourishing work, opportunities in Ephesus to, to teach the gospel when people are asking him, why would he leave just to hasten back to Jerusalem? Well, I would submit to you, again, an entire reading of the New Testament helps put that puzzle piece together. Paul, it looks like, had been on a fundraising trip. He had gone around collecting funds for the needy saints in Jerusalem, and now that he has that collected, he is going to deliver it down in Jerusalem for those needy saints. But this next section is where we see that the book of Acts is not just zeroing in on the acts or the works of the apostles, but it is also telling us about good-hearted brethren who are also doing the work of the Lord. While Paul is going from Corinth to Ephesus to Jerusalem and to Galatia, I now want us to look down at verse 24, where the writer of Acts, Luke, wants to tell us what Priscilla and Aquila were up to back in Ephesus. 
It tells us in verse 24 that there was a Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was competent in the use of the scriptures. He arrived in Ephesus. And he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately about Jesus. And although he knew only of John's baptism, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And after Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained the way of God to him more accurately. And when he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers and sisters wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And after he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. So going back to our map here, when Apollos, uh, or while Paul is over here making his journey back around to Ephesus, we have Priscilla and Aquila left here in Ephesus, and this is where they're introduced to this man named Apollos. And what do we know about Apollos? The text actually has overwhelmingly good things to say about him. He was wrong on something. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But he had a sincere heart. And aside from his sincere, his sincere heart... He was a really good speaker. He knew the scriptures. That would have been the Old Testament scriptures especially. He, he was fervent in spirit. He, he had himself been instructed in the way of the Lord. It even says he was teaching accurately about Jesus. He knew about Jesus. But he was only teaching about John's baptism. It sounds like there was a critical part of Apollos' teaching that he was missing out on. Because where he was still teaching people the same way that John did, that you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, what he was missing out on was knowing that that needed to be done in the name of Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk more about that here in a moment because chapter 19 will handle it. But let's just notice a few things about how Priscilla and Aquila handled this. When they walk in, I want you to imagine what it would have been like to hear this Apollos teaching. I want you to think about the best preacher you've ever heard, and maybe how eloquent he was, how put together, just everything flowed together. Imagine someone like that, and Priscilla and Aquila hear them. Well, they don't publicly shame him. They don't stand up and say, we know the truth, you're a false teacher, you need to get down right now. They don't tackle him down off of the stage. But after he's done, it says they pull him aside and teach him the way of God more accurately. And he receives it. Because he's a humble guy. He wants to know when he's wrong. Do we want to know when we're wrong? Especially if we're teaching? So much so that he was willing to receive this that this humble man is willing to go over to Achaia, back to Corinth, where Paul and Priscilla and Aquila had just been. And he wants to teach the word of God there. And in verse 28, it says that he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. This Apollos was willing to humble himself and change, and God was able to use him for it. And so we pick back up with the story of Paul in chapter 19. While Priscilla and Aquila are straightening out Apollos in Ephesus, and Apollos goes to Corinth, it says in verse 1 of 19, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. Remember, he's on land. He's traveling in. And he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized, he asked them. And to John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Now there were about 12 men in all. As Paul arrives here in this upper part of Ephesus, it seems to me that he has come in on the heels of what Apollos had been teaching these churches in Ephesus. It's likely that these regions had been misinformed by Apollos. And how wonderful is it that the Holy Spirit directed Paul to these very churches that Apollos had been teaching at for Paul to be able to straighten out this issue. 
And what it has to do with is the baptism in the name of Jesus. And what I find really fascinating is what red flag Paul saw that tipped him off. What was the red flag? They had never even heard of the Holy Spirit. When he finds that out, he's like, then what were you baptized into? Because you see, baptism and the Holy Spirit are often connected. They're very close to one another in the book of Acts. You might remember in Acts 2 and verse 38, when he told them to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't believe that's the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, but God's Spirit is going to dwell within you. Something Paul talks about in Romans 8 and in 1 Corinthians 6 as well, and 1 Corinthians 3, that God's Spirit dwells in God's people. And so Paul tells them, if you've not heard of that, then you must not have been baptized into the name of Jesus. And so that's what Paul chooses to emphasize again in verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And just like their possible humble teacher, Apollos, they were willing to accept this message. And they were baptized into the name of Jesus. And it's at this point that Paul does give them the miraculous uh, uh, works and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Something we only see happening through the laying on of the apostles' hands. But let me ask you, is this a lot of information? Sometimes it seems a little random when you read the book of Acts and you just see this, these stories kind of put together. Why don't we spend the rest of our time this morning tying together some of these things? And looking at some lessons that we can take away from these chapters. Well, number one, brethren, we must keep on speaking. Chapter 18 and verse 10, that is exactly what the Lord had in mind for Paul. You are to keep on speaking. Do not be silent. Will there be efforts to silence us at times? And maybe it's not outward efforts. That's certainly true. People out there might try to silence me or silence you from proclaiming the message. But sometimes we try to silence ourselves. Our own temptations and our own worries are what keep us silent. And so I just want us to consider a few of the people that we see in this chapter. Because we are told to keep on speaking, even when we are afraid. Paul was afraid. Sometimes we're told to stop or else we might lose our job. We might lose our friendship. We're told to stop talking about Jesus or we might actually lose our children. Some of you might have had your adult children say that to you. Stop talking to me about this. Am I supposed to keep silent in those moments? Jesus says, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Because the message that you and I have is too important to be silent about. Isn't that what we've learned from the apostles and the early disciples? We have to keep on speaking, brethren. We cannot be silent. How could we whenever our Savior rose from the dead so that we might have our sins forgiven? And I want you to consider Paul in this. How far would the gospel message have gone on Paul's various preaching trips if at every turn someone told him to be silent? He did. I can tell you right now confidently, if Paul and the apostles were silent every time they were told to be, you and I would not be talking about this today. Because they were willing to keep on speaking. They were not afraid. Don't be afraid. Secondly, we need to keep on speaking even when we're just given one chance. Go back over to chapter 18 and verse 19 and 20 when Paul arrives in Ephesus and does not know if he's going to get to come back. He says, I'll only return if God wills. He doesn't know if this is his last time with them. And yet, he still used every opportunity he had to get this message of salvation to those Jews. And often, brethren, we don't take advantage of the one chance or the one shot that we get with people. Because we give in to that way of thinking of, well, you know what? I'm only going to see them this one time. I doubt I'll ever get to follow up with them again. And so why even open my mouth and say something? But wait, isn't that the exact reason why you should open your mouth and say something? Because if this is the one shot, if this is the one chance you have with them, why not take it? Because our message is too important to keep silent about. Sometimes we're tempted to stop speaking 
because we're intimidated. How intimidating do you think it would have been to have to approach Apollos? Now, I recognize Priscilla and Aquila had truth on their side, but I would imagine it would still be intimidating. There might be some other Bible students in the audience who, you know your scriptures, you know how to argue these things, you know how to articulate them in a helpful way, but still, when you sit down with somebody who is well-spoken, it's a little intimidating at times. But Priscilla and Aquila were not perturbed by that. What made them approach this man confidently is that they knew that they had truth on their side. And they were not going to just keep silent. How easy would it have been for them to say, you know what, he's got most of it right. He, he's all, I mean, he's teaching about Jesus. He's saying he's the son of God. He's telling everybody the miracles he did. Why don't we just back off a little bit? I mean, after all, he is baptizing them. Do you see my point? That 10% he was wrong on was still enough for them to want to go and talk to him about it. They kept on speaking, and we should too, even when we're intimidated. Brethren, we must keep on speaking even if we've been wrong in the past. Just think about Apollos on this point. How would it feel to know that for however long he's been preaching this doctrine that he was wrong? Imagine what emotions he was having in the moment. I've been not telling everyone the full truth? I think it would be really easy if you were Apollos to say, you know what, I'm going to hang the hat up. If I was wrong on this, I'm just done teaching. I'll I'll become a Christian, I'll go to church, I'll hunker down, but I'm just done talking about this. But that's not what Apollos did. He went on over to Corinth, and in verse 28, he was vigorously refuting the Jews and publicly demonstrating through the uh, scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. And so even if I've been wrong for years on something, once I've been corrected, that should give me all the more of a reason and desire to want to go out and teach and preach the truth with a new vigor and with a new excitement. And another reason we sometimes keep silent is because whatever the issue is that we want to talk to someone about is personal. Brethren, there there ain't nothing more personal than telling somebody that they haven't been baptized for the right reason. That's a personal thing to get into with somebody. And yet, that's exactly what Paul approaches them about in chapter 19. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And yet, we still shy away from those kinds of conversations. We want to keep silent. But we need to be like all of these examples and keep on speaking. We have truth on our side. One other thing that just impresses me about this section is that little thing that Jesus said to Paul in chapter 18. I have many people in this city. I want you to think about how true that is of Fishers and Noblesville and Lawrence and Cicero and all of the places that make up this local congregation. And I want you to think back to the mid-90s when the Bozier families and the Littell family started this congregation and came together in the basement of a bank. And God was saying, I have many people in this city. Many of you were baptized right behind me because there were many people in this city. And so that includes us, those of us who have found it and have been excited about it. But brethren, that also includes a whole bunch of people who aren't in the pews yet. That includes people who need to find us. I love these two little parables in Matthew 13. They're one verse parables. In Matthew 13, in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field. And that man found it and reburied it. And in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. What's really interesting about this guy is it doesn't look like he was going around looking for the treasure. He kind of stumbled upon it. And when he found it, it was willing to give everything up for. And brethren, we ought to be creating opportunities for people to find us. Even when maybe they're not searching, they're not looking for it. So that means we need to open our mouth. We need to live in a godly way. So that they will see something is different about us. God has many people in this city. 
We need to get to work. And then also create opportunities for those who are searching. That very next verse says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And when he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. There are people searching, brothers and sisters. And we need to be there. Available when they start seeking. Seeking. How accessible are you and I to them? Can they turn to you? Can they turn to me when they are ready to find it? Thirdly and lastly this morning. In Acts 19, when Paul arrives at Ephesus, I find it so personal but I think it's important for us all to consider our own baptism this morning. And just ask the question, into what was I baptized? Because that is the very question that Paul was asking them. What, what then were you baptized into? And first off, if we're going to answer a question like that, let's just start somewhere obvious. Let's talk about what that word baptism literally means. Ask yourself, was I immersed? Because this word baptism comes up a lot in the book of Acts. And every time, the idea is being submerged, absolutely dunked, fully in water. That's what this is talking about. And so if that's not been my experience, then it doesn't matter what you were baptized into, you weren't baptized. <laughs> you need to be immersed into the name of Jesus. But then secondly, was I immersed into the church? That's something that's often taught in other places. That's what baptism is for. You're saved before you're baptized, once you say the sinner's prayer and you put your faith in Jesus, and it's at that point, then you can be baptized into our church. That's a very common teaching. Maybe that was your experience, and maybe it was full immersion. I don't know. But if that was your experience, you were not baptized into Jesus. You were baptized into a church into a denomination. But you need to get into Jesus. And brethren, let me tell you, there are so many benefits of being baptized into Jesus. I don't want to be baptized into some man, into some group, to some church, some organization. Because as we've been reading through the book of Romans, we've been hearing about all of the benefits of those who are what? In Christ. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We need to be baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Because it is only there that we have the forgiveness of our sins. Amen. Romans 6 ties this all together when he says, Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Because it is at his death where he died for the salvation of all of us. i got to be connected to that. And baptism is exactly where that happens at. And so if you've not done that this morning, you are still lost in your sins. You are not in Jesus Christ and you must get in him today before it's everlasting too late. If you're subject to that call or need the prayers of this congregation, won't you come now as we stand and as we sing?